All right. Oh, we're all set. Cool. Sweet. All right, let's get rocking and rolling. So we have a lot to get through today. Um, thanks, Christian, for setting this up. So we have a couple of people to introduce. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome our new COO, um, Kenny Rowe. Uh, Kenny, uh, Kenny doesn't need a lot of introduction to those people who are in the know in the crypto space, but uh, he's one of the founders of MakerDAO. Um, and I think MakerDAO just, just uh, launched something, is that correct? A stable coin? Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a proof of concept. It's called um, Psy. Our, our final um, simple, our stable coin will be called DAI, and this is the simple version of that. And it's just a, to try to test out some of the market dynamics, but it is live on the, on the live net. Um, we haven't started really publicizing it too much, but there'll be some more information coming out pretty soon about um, Psy and it's how it works. And it's, it's a very simple, cool, uh, stable coin, but it, it seems to be working so far. So it's uh, pretty cool. That, that's really awesome. That's great news. Uh, so we're, we're hoping that, uh, that uh, uh, the MakerDAO offerings, which seem to be quite independent of the blockchain, can be run on top of uh, our chain as well. And That's the idea. Yeah, hoping that uh, Kenny will, will drive some of that action. Um, uh, Kenny's also interested in governance. And uh, you want to you say a little bit more about how you want to engage uh, with the co-op? Sure, yeah. So one of the um, things that I primarily work on for Maker is sort of community and uh, governance structures, like how we make decisions and move forward on things. And I also work with a couple other projects, uh, Aragon, one of them on governance and uh, a few other here and there. So my idea, I have a few ideas about what the things, some of the things I've learned in the crypto space about how to uh, manage tokens and how to kind of come to consensus on ideas, um, how to get together as a community, kind of like this meeting here. So um, trying to bring those to a new kind of, well, not a new, but a, a legal structure, uh, the co-op, which is... Uh, um, it, it has some similarities to some of the things that we're doing in the crypto space. So it's going to be an interesting, interesting to see how we can merge those two together to, to have a, a legal entity with the legal property and be able to sign contracts and do that sort of thing. And then how to translate that onto a, a blockchain, something similar that has powers to um, move tokens around and potentially even down the road do um, protocol, you know, updates and changes, that kind of thing. Cool. Very, very good. Uh, Kenny will also be helping me with uh, some operation stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be really good to get some of that off my plate so I can be focusing more on, on uh, delivering the tech. Um, we also have, uh, so, so everyone should welcome, welcome Kenny. Um, thank, thank you very much. And thank so, you, everyone. Um, and uh, we also have uh, Meta who is joining us. Hello, Meta. Um, Hello. Meta is going to be helping out with some of the project management uh, on the way to Mercury. So um, yep. Meta works for Pyrofex, um, who's doing a lot of the, uh, the uh, implementation work uh, alongside of ArtChain uh, Dev. So you want to say a few words about yourself? Gosh, um, yeah, I come from industry. I've worked with Nash for several years and very, very excited to be part of this project and looking forward to getting us to the Mercury milestone. So very excited to be on board and looking forward to working with you all. Thank you very much, Greg. Sweet, thank you. Thanks. It's good to have some, some management on. Uh, uh, we, we also have um, uh, Bronco, who is going to be at the end of the hour giving us a little demo of uh, an update on where we are with the membership sign-up pages and, um, and the private sale pages. So people uh, can, can see that. Uh, the membership sign-up pages will not be open uh, uh, for, for public use for a little bit longer. We're kind of rolling this out in stages. Um, but you can get a, get a sense of how that uh, how that's coming along a little bit later in the hour. Um, so let's move along. Uh, let's see, Ed, do you want to give any updates? Yeah, not, not a whole lot of detail. Um, been uh, spent some time on vacation last week. Uh, been focused on the uh, token sale prep, which will uh, go on, uh, give some more status as we go on. Uh, had, had some interesting calls around the uh, and emails around uh, music business requirements 
Um, so that was great, uh, and more follow-up on that, uh, and have been working in the areas of wallets and identity. So that's a quick update, what I'm up to. Cool. That's that's great. Yeah, yeah. I very much, we've been talking with uh, Peter Harris of Resonate um, and uh, uh, Lewis Marks of Robodope um, uh, to to begin um, what we consider to be uh, a very exciting process of gathering requirements for uh, some decentralized music offerings that will sit on top of our chain co-op or the our chain platform. Um, yeah, so that's, it's, it's really interesting to see the debate shaping up. And one of the things that's come out of it is, is whether or not, um, the platform is sort of organized or focused around, I mean, the, the music sharing uh, application platform that sits above our chain, whether or not it's organized around, um, uh, artifacts like, you know, albums or, or, uh, uh singles or streaming that kind of thing, or whether or not it's organized around the performance event. Um, and those other things uh, drive people to the events. Um, I've been hearing from music industry leaders for several years that, that uh, uh, the money is actually in performance and the other things are kind of almost like lost leaders to get people to the performance. Yeah. Um, so it's, just, it's, it's a very interesting requirements discussion to see how that, that shapes out. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about, about working with, uh, with Resonate and, uh, Ropadope and others. Uh, I think, uh, Imogene Heap actually reached out to us, uh, uh, last week. And so we're, we're going to be talking to Imogene, uh, in the, in the not too distant future, maybe as early as September. Um, so yeah, it's also, yeah, VR is an interesting use case, uh, for sure. Um, okay, so moving right along, um, Mike and I have been doing some uh, work uh, to, Mike came up with some great counterexamples to um, drive out the um, question of whether or not we can do the whole thing um, with the proof theory, do the whole ladle algorithm with proof theory, or, uh, or uh, whether we have to mix in model theory. And um, what, it, what it appears is that we can apply a kind of fairly heavyweight filter um, on the models uh, to uh, allow us to do much more proof theoretically. So the, the filter is, is that every um, uh, Lavier theory uh, is also a geometric theory. Um, and so if we restrict our models to being uh, geometric theories, um, then we can, uh, we can have the the um, calculations be predominantly um, uh, proof the theoretic, which is an important thing because uh, it can be a lot faster to do it that way. Um, Mike, did you want to add anything uh, on, on that discussion? Yeah, so the notion of Lavier theory is pretty weak. There's a slightly weaker notion of theory called the prop. Um, it has to do with um, symmetric monoidal categories. And so if you want to talk about a very weak, simple structure like a monoid, that has, uh, we usually think of it as a set with an associative multiplication table and an identity element. So that's a very simple structure to define. Um, and so you don't need many requirements of the theory of the language in which you write theories in order to express it. Uh, so because of the weakness of the language, it is a very general thing, has lots and lots of different kinds of models. So in addition to, you know, string concatenation, which is the canonical model in set, we also have that monads are models of the theory of monoids. And um, associative algebras are models of the theory of, of monoids. So they apply in lots of different contexts. One of the downsides is that um, if you express this, our, uh, our term calculus and our theory using a weak language, like a Lavier theory, um, 
then there are things that we expect to hold when we're thinking about sets that don't hold in these more general ones. And that was the trouble, was that we were trying to come up with a distributive law that would always hold. And we found that it didn't hold in the most general case. But by adding extra stuff to the language in which we express our theory, by adding the ability to talk about uh, infinitary joins, by adding um, function types and, and various other things, we restrict the number of models, but we are able to have much more powerful models. And so that's what it turns out is happening here if we move, if we promote a Lavier theory to a geometric theory, then it, the uh, distributive law doesn't hold as generally, but it does hold in the cases we care about. And so then we can do the proof theoretic stuff in just those cases. So I, while Mike was talking, I just drew a little picture to, to help people understand. I'll do a quick screen share. So, so essentially, what, what Ladle says is that um, um, a type is the formation of a program uh, over um, a notion of collection. So you, you describe, um, you, you could think of this as kind of lifting the notion of program point-wise through a notion of collection. But, but essentially, your, your, type, your type description is, is kind of a, an abstract way of describing um, collections uh, where you, you know something about the, the terms that are inside the collection. And, then and the, the name distributive law comes from thinking of the collection as adding together a bunch of terms. And the terms we kind of think of as multiplying in a very generic sense. So here we have a product of sums on the left and then a sum of products on the right. And that's where the name distributive law comes from. Right, exactly. So you're, you're, you're sort of, you're turning every program over collection to collections over programs. Um, so let me get the plurality right so it's consistent. Wouldn't you need reversibility to do that? No, you do not. It depends upon, uh, it depends upon your collection. Um, so if your collection has a notion of negation, then almost uh, every, in, in, then having a notion of reversibility is consistent with your negation. If your collection doesn't have a notion of uh, uh, negation, for example, hiding algebras don't have a notion of negation or don't have a built-in notion of negation. You can define one if you have a, if you have a false object. Um, but it doesn't have a built-in notion of negation, and because you don't have a built-in notion of negation, you don't, have, uh, you don't necessarily need reversibility. Um, and, and in fact, it's, it's all of these kinds of details that we're sort of attempting to get right once and for all. <laughs> um, so that, uh, you know, the people who are looking at these don't have to consider them uh, in a point-wise fashion. So what, what Mike said is, is um, you can kind of see this as, um, the collection is, is sums of terms, T1 plus yada, 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 um, uh, T2. Um, and uh, you want to be able to multiply that out, right? So have I, have I got this right? Right. And then you want to be able to then use the distributive law to turn this into... Um, there we go, into what you would expect it to do, right? Which is like that. So that's what the, that's a, a sloganized form of what the distributive law does. And so the input to ladle is how you make programs, how you make collections, and the distributive law itself. 
And what, what we were talking about uh, in terms of uh, Levere theories versus geometric theories is the language in which you can describe collections. So if you, if you make the language in which you describe collections be Levere theories, then it's a little bit too weak to do all the kinds of things we want to do with our algorithm. If you make the, the language uh, richer, uh, say geometric theories, then it allows us to to do most of the things we want to do with the algorithm um, at the proof theoretic level. And that's, uh, and that's advantageous from the point of view of, of um, uh, uh, speed of calculation. Um, and then the, 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 the final point to make is that we are considering models like quantum models. Um, and, and so when we go to geometric theories that eliminates the quantum models, so in future work, we'll have to look at relaxation of the, um, of the geometric theories in order to capture what we consider to be decent quantum models. That's a, and that's captured to some extent in our notion of collection. The reason that we needed geometric models was because we were using hiding algebras as our notion of collection, which has uh, a concept called top, which is the union of all terms. And, um, and so to be able to express the idea of taking an infinitary union, we needed the geometric uh, theories. But if we aren't using hiding algebras for a collection, if we have some other notion, then we don't need to promote it to geometric theory in order to find a distributive law. Yes, exactly. Um, cool. So that was a, that's a, a little bit of an update there. Um, we also have been um, uh, doing work. So like Joe and I did uh, some work on the um, the cost model. Uh, so you, I don't know if anyone here caught the Casper the Casper stand up uh, on Monday, um, but one of the things that came out at the end is is kind of the in, intriguing and fun problem that we have because we are concurrent of, of trying to make sure that the phlogiston gets distributed out to um, the different threads in a way that is relatively fair. Um, so in particular, what you don't want is uh, one thread starving while another has a surfeit of phlogiston. So you need a mechanism by which the, they coordinate and uh, if, if a thread is, is starving and another thread is, is done, um, uh, then you can um, uh, kind of reapportion that uh, that phlogiston over. Um, so that's uh, that that's part of the problem. And right now, what we're what Joe and I are just looking at is a sort of a nice, clean characterization of the estimate of the cost. Um, so let me just draw draw that for people, so people have a sense of of what we're talking about. Um, Oops, not that one. So we begin with an unadorned Rolang program. So this is a Rolang program here. And then the Rolang program gets transformed into a Rolang program that's annotated with a cost estimate. So plus a cost estimate. And um, using that cost estimate, we can then um, uh, provide back to whoever is deploying the, the Roland contract. Uh, so let, let me change this from program to contract. Might be easier for people. Okay, so whoever is, uh, is deploying the Roland contract will need to know how much rev uh, to provide. So the cost estimate that we provide is an estimate in terms of um, phlogiston and then there's a, a backward calculation from uh, phlogiston to rev, and that, that um, rev number can then be provided back to whoever is deploying this contract. And that, of course, will be based on market rates. Um, but there's, a, there's, another, there's another transformation of the program, and we'll, we'll run this vertically. Okay, so this program is the, the Roland contract um, uh, with source modification uh, uh, to, uh, to ensure 
phlogiston rate limitations. Okay, so that runs this way. Um, and it's similar, but it's not the same, right? Um, so this is all about um, providing a version of the contract that won't take a step um, if it doesn't have the phlogiston. And likewise, if it does take a step, it decrements the phlogiston that's available to it, right? And so this is gonna be kind of the maximum estimate uh, if you want to take k steps, you're going to need to provide at least this much rev, right? And which will get you this much phlogiston. And then here we have the uh, the 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 variant of the program that's rate limited and resource constrained based upon um, the phlogiston that's available. So these are are two different calculations, and they're interrelated in a particular way. So I just wanted to give, again, give people a background on, on this and, and what's going on here. Um, Joe, did you want to say any more? Is, is Joe here? Uh, I don't see him. I don't see him. Okay, anyway, so, so Joe is not, but we had a, we had a good conversation this morning uh, to, to, to talk to that update. I guess my question would be, since you can't know what the values of your inputs are going to be until runtime, uh, it becomes extremely difficult at compile time. It would seem to me that the only way, ultimately, to be fair, is to essentially loan every thread all of the phlogiston, and at the end, if it used more, or at any point, any thread used more, then was allocated, it would fail. And you would just uh, eat the cost of the extra computation if it went over, but you didn't know about it. <laughs> sure, so that, that's an approach, and there are obvious, there are obvious challenges to both. So in, in, the, ca in the case of, of the forward uh, comp uh, compilation uh, style, what you do is you calculate a maximum. Um, and, and that maximum uh, actually is uh, fairly well bounded because at no point do you ever send like these unbounded collections, right? You're always, you're always sending. You don't know whether it's going to be one byte or a hundred gigabytes. But you do, so, actually. you do. And the reason you do is because you never send a hundred gigabytes. You always send a pointer. So you know exactly how much. So, so the, the issue is how much of the collection do they traverse? You don't know how much of a collection they traverse, but that's guaranteed by the by the um, the step bound, right? So you you you're giving up front a step bound. So yeah, but your transaction. Okay. Uh, no, it's. I mean, you're you're right. From the, from the point of view of of halting, you can't know how much of the collection you traverse, but every time you you traverse a collection. Um, that uh, you know that you're you know that that's a certain amount of cost, and then you have a step bound on the cost, right? That's that's what it comes down to. Greg, can you um, go go through this and with the example of how some people might be familiar with, like how Ethereum solves this problem with a with a gas limit and a gas price in the transaction? Yeah, so so that's exactly what I was doing, right? So. Um, Phlogiston is playing the role of gas here. So, so here's, here's the gas limit calculation. Here's the estimate of the gas limit. And um, you go from the uh, estimate uh, of gas uh, through the price of gas to a certain amount of rev. So when the contract is deployed and given a certain amount of rev, it can take this amount of, uh, it can utilize this modified source, which has the gas limit enforced uh, to um, make, make K steps in that, in that computation. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, is there any um, considerations like what uh, Jim was saying for concurrency? If there's multiple things going on, does it 
somewhat complicate things or is it sort of built into what's going on in each one of these pieces? Yeah, so what I, that's exactly what I was saying at the top. So it does complicate things because uh, if the contract, let's say, has N different threads, um, then um, it could be the case um, that a particular thread uh, might get starved, whereas another thread is, um, is, uh, uh, has a surfeit of phlogiston and so what you and 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 that's something that can only be calculated dynamically right because um uh if they if you if you take if you take them you can take the max of each of each thread um they provide the 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 rev uh, and then you've got sort of a a a a linear programming problem right to to apportion out the phlogiston that comes out of the rev to each of the each of the different threads according to their maximum needs um, so it, it can be the case that you have you've done a bad apportioning, and a thread comes in far under its limit because you can't know that ahead of time. Whereas uh, an, another thread is is at risk of starvation, um, and so you want to give the thread that's at risk of starvation some from the thread that's that's come to the end of its computation and uh, and has a surfeit. Right, so there's a little bit of coordination that goes on uh, in the in the modified um, uh, version of the contract that is rate limited. So that's different than the way it's done in Ethereum. Does that make sense? Yeah. And do a contract specify the number of threads to be used, or is that also something that's dynamic? Oh, the the uh, that's a that's a really good question. I, I really appreciate that question. So let, let's 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 look at that. Let me grab this one. Um, th that's at the heart of rolling. So if I say contract C, and let's say it has Chan 1 through Chan N is equal to, and then here's the body of the contract. All right, so you, we might do something like this um, for uh, data 1, from Chan 1, do a computation, and in parallel, right, so that's what the vertical bar means for data 2 from Chan 2, do this, oh, let me label these, there we go, do this other computation, um, and then, um, so those are all running in parallel, and let's say that just for grins that we know that P1 and P2 are ultimately going to fire. Um, in fact, let's make this nice and crisp and clear. So we'll make two private channels, um, say um, X1 and X2. And we'll say that P1 is parametric in X1. And we'll say that P2 is parametric in X2. And then for and then what we'll say, so this is a fork join. Um, uh, so for um, uh, T1, which is a trigger from X1, and at the same time we need T2, T2 which is a trigger from X2, right? then uh, what we want is to say output um, on Chan uh, 3 and um, some some function of t1 and uh, yada 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 output and let's make this function three just so we can see how they line up and and then we're going to go back using this example and calculate all of the different threads um, and this is t2 let's make this t1 and t2 just for fun and make this t1 and T2. Okay, so there's our function, and this is on, we're outputting this on Chan in like that. There, okay. So now it turns out that we can actually see that just with the vertical bar at the top level, we have one, two, three threads. 
right? Just by count, counting the different, you, you can actually see it lexically. Here's a thread which is waiting um, for input from, from the external world. At least it's external relative to C. And here's another thread that's waiting for input uh, from the external world, okay? And then once it gets data from that thread, it's gonna run a, run a, a sub um, uh, contract or sub calculation, right? Which is represented by P1 and eventually that thing is going to output on X1. Uh, likewise for P2. And then over here, uh, what we have is another thread that's waiting on X1 and X2 together. They must both happen before the whole thing can go. And when, when it gets T1 and T2, then a bunch of threads are being run. Basically, um, uh, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way up to N, right? Those, and, and each of those are all, we can easily see that lexically. Oh, I didn't close off my. We can see that lexically on, you know, basically they're the, they're the outputs that are between the vertical bars. So the programmer is specifying the threads, but they're specifying logical threads. They're not specifying uh, how those logical threads are related to hardware threads. They're not even about replication. Uh, replication is another, is another example. Um, so, so, you, so replication would uh, potentially spin off an unbounded number of threads where, uh, you know, um, uh, this could be a server, for example. So this server um, basically takes in data here, takes in data here, does these subcalculations, and only after it's done the subcalculations will it do, uh, will, will it start um, serving up um, the, the, uh, back again to the world. How would you how would you provide logistics to a server that is running forever? Yeah, so that that's a nice one. What you what you can say is that um, for this particular instance of the server, you need this much logistics to run this thread, this thread, and this thread, right? And then you're going if you're going to launch another instance, you're going to need this much and this much and this much. And then if you're going to launch another instance, you need this much and this much and this much. So you can see, you can see exactly how that works, right, Jim? So, yeah. so, 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 so in, other words, in other words, it's rate limited. If you want to go K steps in any direction, right, and there's only one direction that, that, is, uh, that is unbounded, right, and that's this one. So this one is, assuming that P is, P1 is bounded and P2 is bounded, then there's only one thread which is potentially unbounded. And now what we have is the, is the, the assumed uh, uh, limitation that we only get to go K steps, right? So that's the, that's, and, and so that's basically going K levels deep, uh, K minus however much this costs. Um, uh, K levels deep in the exploration of this server, right? So if you want to keep if you want to keep um, keep going with that server, then you have to pay more for logistics. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering. You know, is that done with a pragma, or you know, how do we how do we tell it we want to give it more phlogiston? <laughs> right. So, so you can see that you can see when it runs out of phlogiston, j just as you said, you'll get an out of phlogiston error, right? So, if you so you can add more, you can add more phlogiston at that time, right? So you can you can make that so you can you can you can set this up to to uh, to to essentially um, be rent, right? Um, alternatively, I think the simpler thing to do is that you require that some some rev come in in this contract to be able to launch the next instance. It's a much simpler approach. Then, then you're not dealing with exceptions. So in order, in order to get this going, um, these things have had to result in an in input of phlogiston, which means, uh, which mean, or an, an, an input of rev, which means that the rev is coming off of one or both of these channels here. All right. Sweet. Thank you. Thank you. No, these are these are great questions. I really appreciate it. Hey, okay. Quick question about um, calculation of phlogiston. What are what are the dimensions of 
split just in, I think oftentimes this list is ab abbreviated, and I'm just curious what the complete intended list is. So we talked, we've talked about compute, bandwidth, storage, memory, and then uh, potentially foreign function interfaces. Greg, <laughs> are you there? Sorry, um, we cue the cue the um, the movie music for answering that question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Do you hear the question? Uh, uh, so, so no, I just I had a um, I had someone come downstairs listening to something and gave them some headphones so that they could listen <laughs> privately while we had the call. Do um, you want me to repeat the question? I uh, know. I think I, I think I got it. Yeah. So so uh, currently, what we have are four different categories. And I intend those to be uh, exhaustive as super categories, but they're not exhaustive as um, because each of those subcategories can subsequently be uh, refined. Um, so effectively, have we have a compute step, we have memory access, we have network access, and we have storage access, and then we can um, we can refine each of those into subcategories. Um, uh, but but uh, like in the case of foreign functions, um, okay. that will then map on to compute access, uh, memory access, network access, and storage access. Okay, and then a related that that's helpful. Um, and then a related question: Let's say we were building a, a content delivery network similar to Akamai or S3, where we wanted to have some um, uh, service level agreements about how much bandwidth and throughput um, to, to the internet a node has. Is that more of a node quality of service reputation thing or is that part of Phlogiston? Um, so the, 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 the aim and the hope is that uh, those kinds of quality of service things are, um, are, are made available through the Phlogiston Rev capabilities so that's the that's the, okay. the desired result and that's what we're okay. doing two level thing right so the casper contracts are all written in um are all written in in, in uh, row line right so that we can we can we can do that kind of uh, bootstrapping uh, yeah got it thank you so, so the contract so just to further that for one second because i think that's really important so when the contract is written or when the row line is written, is it going to tell you that you don't have enough gas or uh, phlogiston to service it at the level that you've, you've written the contract, right? Uptime or servicing, let's say, 10 channels at once for uh, a period of an hour. Yeah, that, that, so that's the, uh, I mean, we have to get better and better about the cost estimates, but that's the, the, the ultimate goal. Right. I mean, right now, um, your specification is a little, um, it's wall clock time, whereas uh, the, the cost estimates are not wall clock time, but they're essentially transition time. So here's, here's a moment in which time evolves. Here's another moment in which time evolves. So you can get from these, the, the kind of transition time to wall clock time uh, if you know things about channel rates. And you know things about data transmission. Um, so, so you know, ideally, yes, we want to be able to do things from wall clock time, but that's not how time evolves in these systems without additional information. Hopefully, that answers. Sure. You. Yeah. yeah it, it was an example, but I, I think I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I mean, we really, really do want to be able to say things about wall clock time. It's just. It's a little, it's a little trickier, and it's a little squishier. Sorry, you um, dropped out, Greg. Oh, really? Can you hear me now? Yeah, it was just for a minute. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm on the, the, uh, the higher bandwidth uh, channel on the router. So, I, um, anyway, I'm just all I'm saying is that is that wall clock time can be a little squishy, um, especially in a concurrency setting and in a distributed setting. Uh, so there's this whole issue of network time that's that that has to be addressed when you want to start going to wall clock time. But yeah, cool. Um, 
All right, so it's now 1143 and we have a few other things to do. Um, uh, uh, the first thing I want to do, Bronco, are you on? Uh, hey, Greg, yeah, I am. Give me just a second. Can you hear me? Yes. So you want to give a quick demo of the uh, pages for membership sign-on? Yeah, sure, why not? Okay, let me just uh, share the screen. One second. Uh, can you guys see the screen? Yes. Okay, cool. Maybe you can um, move the, uh, the list of participants to one side. Right in the middle of the screen is, yeah. Oh, uh, actually, I don't see them. Me oh. either. Oh, that might be yours. That's it's awesome. yours. Yeah, it's mine. Ah, that's funny. I thought it was local to his machine. Cool. Okay, uh, so we have the sign-in page here. Basically, user would sign in over this page. Uh, we have a sign-up page as well. Here, user enters uh, basic information, email. Um, let's use one that I didn't yet. If he is an individual or business membership, uh, password, he can see what password he, he typed. Just in case he doesn't miss it. There's a confirmation. Here's to choose a state. It's a type of head. If you choose the United States, you're basically asked to optionally add the state. And then also at the end to, to do the capture. I'm usually bad at this capture, but let's do it. So afterwards, we get an email. Give me just a second. Uh, that we should confirm in the sign up. I'll just copy the link since we didn't implement how the man looks. Afterwards, user can. So if the user forgot the password, we have forgot password as well functionality here. Um, afterwards, when you log in, I guess this is the password. Okay. And I'll forget this one. Is it this? No, oh, shit. <laughs> no worries. Okay. Um, here, so after the user sign ups for the first time, verifies the email, uh, he can basically make a membership request. He would get to this page uh, where he would read about terms and conditions. Hopefully he will accept it. Uh, afterwards, there would be a page where the membership payment should be done on. And um, basically this button would open. I'm having problems with Coinbase API. Uh, this button would open a, a model where the user could pay in Bitcoins for the membership, membership fee. And afterwards, uh, when user finishes that, basically this page would show that transaction is on its process and uh, that after it gets uh, into the press, basically he will be become a member and we have one more page here which is important <laughs> and so, uh, meanwhile when transaction is uh, processing the user can see maybe uh, what's what status is of the, of the transaction and later on when user gets accepted, uh, there would be also a private sale button where all information and uh, possibility to, to engage in purchasing the rocks would be. So that's what we have for now. Very good. No, thank you so much. If, if people have any um, comments about um, the look and feel or, or you know, the form, um, uh, yeah, that's my. What are we talking about? <laughs> um, so, so if anyone, if anyone, please uh, in in Slack, you know, either uh, uh, PM me or um, uh, 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 or you know, uh, just just reach out to us and say, hey, you know, maybe maybe you should uh, reconsider the 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 uh, you know form factor. Or, 
or anything like that, responsiveness, any, anything at all. If you have any questions, comments, concerns about the membership sign up. Uh, I, I just have a question about, you know, uh, it, it, since membership will only be allowed at one state at a time, you know, what happens if your state doesn't, isn't supported yet or your country is not supported yet? You still get to sign up? Uh, so if you're, if you're in a restricted country list, no, you can't sign up. Um, well, if the, if, if the co-op doesn't have an agreement with Florida, I, I can still sign up? Uh, we're, we, I believe that all 50 states uh, have, have we've, had, we've done the filings for all 50 states. Um, Except so, for New York, I believe. Uh, no, even, we, we've, done the, we've done the filings for co-op membership even in New York. Uh, it's just that uh, we're still working out a solution for private sale people. Um, so we don't have a we don't we don't yet have a good solution for private sale folks who want to participate who live in New York. Uh, we're close. Uh, we have a we have a couple of different options that we're pursuing, but we uh, we don't yet have. Uh, so actually, we spent a great deal of time yesterday um, in a in the private sale call uh, talking through our options. Um, and as soon as we have uh, things a little bit more buttoned down there, uh, we will let people know. Um, hopefully by Thursday we'll we'll have a, a, a an answer there. Um, so that uh, uh, covers the major issues with respect to the private sale. One thing people should be aware of: once they are a member they will automatically be registered via their membership ID in Discord. So um, here's the Archain Discord channel, um, and people will be invited to that um, uh, a, a, a by their, their, uh, um, their, uh, their, their using their membership ID. Um, so uh, that will be uh, the way we can um, provide a, a basic mechanism which allows members to engage with each other. Um, and that's where I'm going to be spending most of my time. Once people are in, uh, once we have uh, a good membership, um, then most of my time will be engaged with the membership and I'll be withdrawing more and more from Slack. Um, and uh, so it's, this is just a part of a, a motivation to become a member. Um, so if you want to engage in the conversation, the conversation will be, the real conversation will be over in the membership channel um, and you're automatically signed up for that as a part of the membership sign-on process. Uh, so Griff is asking if there's um, uh, a plan to allow for membership payment in uh, Ether. Uh, we really want to support that. Uh, right now we don't have a good uh, merchant API. Um, if someone wants to um, um, proffer one, uh, that would be great, especially one that's got the, the kinks worked out. Um, so if, uh, if people have a solution yet, uh, get, get it to us as soon as possible, and maybe we can get it in for the private sale. Um, yeah, exactly. Finally, Discord. That's right. <laughs> okay. Um, so that covers just about that. Is there any um, other comments, questions, uh, or anything about the private sale? White paper. Yes, the white paper. I'm feverishly working to get that out. Uh, it should be available when we go live uh, with the private sale. Um, I was hoping to get that out before then, but there's just too many things for me to attend to. Um, yeah, it's just insane. Um, uh, I will need help with the white paper after I'm, I've completed the draft that I'm working on currently. So, yeah. Um, all right. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? We've got about eight minutes left in the hour. Um, So I had a question in the uh, chat about folks who became members a while ago through, I think there were several different processes. 
Um, is there some way to roll them into this? Yeah, we're format? gonna we're gonna have we're gonna have to deal with that. I mean, all, all of that was done prior to when we actually had the um, securities exemptions filed with all fifty states. Right. Uh, so we want to honor the people who who came in um, uh, through these sort of informal processes that were done in a very decentralized fashion. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what, what I would suggest is that th those individuals go through this process again, pay pay 20 bucks, and then ask for a refund of, of anything they previously provided. Yeah, yeah, and then we'll, we'll and they'll need to provide us the transaction IDs um, right. uh, we provided in the past, yeah. No, I, I, uh, I, I apologize that we just, we weren't well coordinated earlier. Yeah, but no, it's, it, it's getting better. <laughs> right on, okay. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Thanks for asking that question, Chris. Really appreciate it. People that came through the uh, HJ's membership form uh, and entered an Ether or Bitcoin address, we do have the IDs for those. Great. Great. Very good. Um, okay. So um, there was one other point I wanted to touch on, uh, but it slipped my mind. So maybe I'll, I'll let that one go. Um, if there's nothing else, I'm more than happy to yield the time back to the community. Um, we're, uh, Ed and I are going to jump on the call right after this one with Bronco to, to, to give a quick, um, it may be that we, uh, we make a judgment call to delay the start of the private sale by a day or two, but we're going to make that, we're going to make that call today. And that'll be announced in the private sale channel. Um, we also, from, from New York, we can start doing some more meetups whenever you guys are ready to Skype in, if that's something you're interested in doing. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Very interesting. That's a great idea. We could have, uh, if, if we can collect uh, uh, a group of rock purchasers together or... or um, around that. So Nathan, that's definitely what we're talking about in the next yeah. couple of weeks. For sure. For sure. Um, let's see. Oh, one thing that I, I that came up for me, I had a really uh, interesting question come in from Mike. Um, uh, so we're, we're working as people know on the re-implementation of the Rosette VM in Scala. Uh, and the way the Rosette VM works is it, it sits there waiting on a, a, a collection of uh, sockets. Um, and when activity shows up on a particular socket, then it wakes up and uh, processes the activity, at least on one of those sockets that, you know, <laughs> the activity should be that, a, you know, a fully formed expression has been submitted. And then the expression is compiled, uh, read, compiled, and, uh, and executed. Um, so uh, the, the hope is that we, we provide a... Um, we, we provide a channel-based uh, abstraction for that. So rather than sockets, we have, we, again, we have a notion of channels. The row VM is, is uh, attending to those channels that are, um, uh, that are uh, um, going to be submitting a, a complete, um, com you know, uh, complete expressions in, in Rolang. Um, either com you know complete rolling expressions or uh, complete bytecode, and so uh, let's see. I actually had the uh, and this this provides uh, another rolling kind of example. Uh, let's see, and and also brings up a point I want to make about um, about communication moving forward. Um, because the Rolang semantics is crisp, um, uh, I really, really want to start utilizing this uh, as a means of specification. Um, so when we when we talk with each other, we can describe uh, computational phenomena using Rolang, even if it's about the implementation of Rolang. And we're going to be having a lot more of this bootstrapping kind of uh, thing anyway. Um, the, after Mercury, one of the f most important things that we'll do is re-implement um, all of our chain in Rolang. Uh, we won't be able to get all of it by Mercury, but uh, after Mercury, we want to be able to do that. So let me 
let me give you the example that I was sharing with Mike. Um, so can people see this? Is this uh, large enough for, for folks? If not, I can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I can refactor. Okay. Um, so here's, uh, here's a way to, of describing how the VM should work uh, with respect to its um, responsiveness to channels. So imagine that you've, you've got a, a contract called the VM loop. Um, and what the VM loop does is it takes uh, channels associated with the console, maybe channels associated with Rabbit, uh, channels associated with HTTP, uh, maybe there's a TCP IP uh, socket or, or so. Um, and then um, there's a big select statement. So you, you might get a full, fully formed expression off the uh, channel console, or you might get a fully uh, a console channel, or you might get a fully formed expression off the rabbit channel, et cetera. Maybe uh, off of the uh, socket channel, uh, you're expecting to get a, a well-formed bytecode. Um, and then um, uh, what you would do in this case Let's say you get um, uh, information coming off of the console channel. Well, first you, you parse the expression. Whatever comes back as the parse, you compile that, and uh, the bytecode that you have there, you execute, right? And that is happening in parallel uh, with running the VM loop again to serve up another request. Another example um, here on the socket channel, um, you're, you're expecting fully formed uh, bytecode, uh, and so um, you can just execute the code and in parallel launch another instance of the VM loop. Now, this, this can be refined so that um, instead of uh, going ahead and executing, you take the bytecode and you plunk it down into a queue that's being served by a number of VM loops. Um, uh, and then those VM loops pull off the bytecode and start executing it. Uh, and that allows you to have, uh, have a little bit more control over the concurrency. Um, so you could have one VM or two VMs or three VMs or however many VMs your hardware can support. Um, so but, so there, there are two levels to the comment I'm trying to make here. One is this code ultimately uh, in the Mercury implementation is going to be expressed in Scala. But to express the idea to Mike and other developers on the team, I wrote down the semantics in Rolang. And, uh, and so we're, we're clear together what this means in terms of Rolang semantics. And so uh, when we go to do the implementation for in inside Scala, we know exactly what this means. Um, and more and more, what we're hoping is to kind of um, utilize uh, Rolang not only as a, an implementation device, but also as a communication device, as a specification device. Here, I've written down for Mike uh, an answer to his question that is, that is quite precise, right? Uh, there's, 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 a there's not a lot of wiggle room in terms of how we interpret this. And I'm, I'm hoping that more and more within the Archain community, we can begin to utilize um, this kind of communication device to express these, these different notions, just like I did um, here, right? So we talked about, we talked about in, in fairly um, clear terms uh, 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 where the concurrency was, uh, how that concurrency was related to phlogiston, um, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that rev could come in on particular channels, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so the point is that we can now, now, we've, now that we've got Rolang, we should start using it uh, to communicate with each other. Um, and so, I, so when someone put in that comment about uh, Rolang tutorial, uh, I think that was Gary, um, uh, when, when someone put in the comment about a Rolang tutorial, uh, I think that's a very apropos comment because more and more I'm hoping that we use it as a, as a kind of communication device and not just to implement uh, contracts. And that will help with the, the promotion of the of uh, the, the language and, and, and the formation of the community. All right. Um, okay. It's 12.02. Anything else? Oh, silence is golden. 
<laughs> All right, uh, Bronco. I just want to mention that bounties are available for facilitation and evaluation. Take the digital life trial um, social ledger. I uh, put a link in the chat and in the community uh, channel. Sweet. All right, I'm going to stop recording you guys.